What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, April 30th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Tesla partners with Bayou for full self-driving rollout in China. It's official. Tesla is getting full self-driving in China, so we will cover what that means for Tesla. Next up, growing shadow fleet makes oil price cap impossible to uh, police. I will then jump over and cover what really is a stacked finance segment for us. First, oil does fall about a dollar, mainly based, uh, based on those Middle East peaks talks um, and U.S. Uh, U.S. rate cut doubts. I will then talk quickly about what happened with uh, North American rigs as we actually lost six, which is unbelievable. We'll then jump over and look at Exxon and Chevron earning some interesting telltale signs in there. And then finally, we will cover Kimbridge Silverboat round four. Holy smokes, they're, they're coming back strong. So we will get to all of that in a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner rocking a solo show today. Stu is out on assignment. We were going to be flip-flopping solos. I'm actually out in the field tomorrow so Stu will be uh uh doing a solo sh- a solo show tomorrow he will then be back we will both then be back in the chair uh for Wednesday so we appreciate you guys holding with us but I'm going to go ahead and kick things off here uh Tesla partners with Bayou for full self-driving rollout in China I'm reading straight from the article here first uh bullet point Tesla's full self-driving or they call S FSD system has been approved for use in China. They went ahead and partnered with the aforementioned Chinese tech giant uh, Bayoud for mapping and navigation software to support the full self-driving within China. Um, This approval within China is seen as a major boost for the company, which has been facing multiple challenges due to the worsening EV price war and high interest rates. Um, It's actually caused Tesla shares to jump uh, jump in the pre-market trading after it was reported in Bloomberg that Beijing Beijing had went ahead and give that green light to roll out its full self-driving. Um, you know, in a separate report by the Wall Street Journal, um, it, it backtracked a little bit. You know, Beijing has tentatively approved the company's plan to launch full self-driving. This does come, as I'm reading straight from the article here, come one day after Elon Musk unexpectedly visited Beijing on Sunday and met with Premier Lin Kao, um, who was previously the communist chief uh, Communist Party chief in Shanghai when Tesla was setting up its automobile manufacturing plant. Um, they all go on to say that uh, Musk also met with Robin Zhang, chairman of Tesla Battery Supplier, Contemporary Amperex Technology, which is in Beijing. Um, analysts are out in, in full force. Webbo Security senior analyst told Bloomberg, quote, this is a watershed moment. Um, this could open up full self-driving in China. This is his quote, which I view as unlocking what could be a golden opportunity for them. And again, the, the, they, they read this earlier in the article, but I think it comes down to the inevitable price war. Again, as China does what they do, everything's going to be a race to the bottom on price. So Elon Musk and Tesla is trying to figure out exactly how are they going to compete in China if they're going to be charging a premium price. Well, that means they probably got to have self-driving because if you don't have self-driving and you're charging $80,000 for a car, it's going to be hard to compete with another EV that's got better battery life, longer range for a lot cheaper because it's manufactured in Chinese. It's exactly what, you know, why we buy Chinese products all the time because they are able to offer the lowest price. So I think this... I agree with the analysis here in terms of this is a boon for Tesla and and it's clear and their stock ran a little bit today, mainly off that back. So great for China. Now you have to remember there was a lot of security concerns that they had to, you know, this is uh, a reading straight from the article. Sources say Tesla will partner with uh, uh, the Bayou to support um, the navigation and mapping. Here we go. Okay. Here's the real quote here, folks. Tesla also has multiple data security and privacy requirements that satisfy the country's regulators. That's a one sentence. That's very ominous. I'd love to see the source code behind that Tesla. Hey, are they, you know, this day, are they sharing this data with the Chinese communist, uh, regime? Who knows? I think that's an interesting question is anytime you're in a Tesla, at least the United States, we know they're recording you in the Tesla. I mean, if you're driving around a Tesla and don't think they have cameras looking at you in the car you're an idiot um but that being said what do they do with that information in china do they have to share that with the chinese communist party interesting note there i love how they just one little sentence in there obviously you know they're trying to make tesla look good yeah we you know we they, i'm with you tesla is great but it'll be interesting to see what their their data privacy stuff is on that so we will make sure to follow up with that um I'd be interested to know what Stu knows about that. But let's jump to the next article here. Growing shadow fleet makes oil price cap impossible 
to police. I'm going to read a lot here from the article. You based our UK based international group of T and I clubs, which are global and a global insurance company says that a growing shadow flea is making it less and less viable to police the G7 price cap on Russian oil. This according to Bloomberg Newell citing a briefing to the UK government. This UK based insurance group notes that about 800 oil tankers uh, have been uh, that it used to insure have switched over to the shadow fleet to support sanctioned Russian oil being sold above the $60 price cap. Stu would be freaking out right now because we're talking about his favorite thing, the dark fleet. But this 800 people, 800 tanks, part of the dark fleet. Unbelievable. Next up. Furthermore, the group goes on to say here in this article, it is impossible for an insurance company to determine whether traders are adhering to the G7 price cap, noting that the policy, quote, appears increasingly unenforceable as ships and associate services move into this parallel trade. Bloomberg quoted um, the group is saying, adding that it is concerned that the increasing responsibility and obligations on companies in the G7 coalition will further risk or, or, or will f- result in further migration of trade activities and ancillary services outside of the G7, which is absolutely unbelievable. This article also points out three weeks ago, Argus Media, which is a I love how they have Argus Media. They're a data company. They have a nice little uh, media company. It's kind of like us. We, we have a little media company. doesn't really do much. We do other stuff in between. But Argus Media, they released a bunch of data cited by Bloomberg that said uh, the uh, Russian Ural-grade crude is being exported for about $75 a barrel, which is, again, $15 above what the $60 quote-unquote G7 price cap is. So you can, I can hear Stu on the other side saying sanctions don't work. It's true, it, especially when the insurance company based out of UK is saying, ah, eh, we're insuring it all. What's crazy to me is 800 tankers. That's not just, that's, the dark fleet is not small. It's a big, big, big number and, and absolutely unbelievable. You know, citing this UK government briefing, Bloomberg said the insurance group was critical of London's efforts at enforcing the price cap, subjecting that the onus has inherently fallen on insurance groups whose members should not be expected to be an extended arm of enforcement for sanctions. Ooh, ooh, wouldn't want to work a little bit too hard, insurance companies. Wouldn't want to have to put a little too much on your plate. I do find that funny. Private industry, hey, it's not our job to do that. We, 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 if we don't insure, we lose money. So I love I, the, 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 the anti-spin is, well, wait, you, you're making money off this. So unless you want to illegally be making money by trading Russian crude, maybe you should abide by it. And maybe the onus does fall on you, the insurance company, and not us, the government. But there's two sides to that. Buy side, sell side. If I'm sitting at an insurance company, of course the government should come in and regulate us. Why was it my job to figure out who's abiding by the sanctions and who's not? I'm just trying to make money. On the other side, to counter that point, yes, you are trying to make money. So you're incentivized not necessarily to care, per se, about where it's coming from. So it's a little bit of he should, see said. But I, again, the big thing out of here, 800 uh, tankers in the dark fleet. Unbelievable. Stu would be freaking out right now. We're definitely going to have to talk about this a little bit on Wednesday in terms of it's the dark fleet is no longer small. It's a significant portion of the market, and we've seen that right now. We know India and China are taking advantage of it. Let's go ahead and quickly move into finance. Before we do that, guys, as always, check us out. World's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. The best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can just check out the description below for all of the links to the articles that I cover here. You can also go ahead um, and find timestamps if you want to jump around. I think on Spotify, they're there itunes it's a little bit iffy you got to buy some third-party software well whatever we'll figure out we'll get it rolled out on there youtube as well thanks everybody um for uh uh all the reviews we've i've, I've actually you know seen a bunch of new ones popped in so i appreciate everybody who's done and who done that also in the link to the podcast or in the description to the podcast you can check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com the best place for all your data and energy news combo um we appreciate everybody there you can also uh, connect with Stu and i on linkedin there. All right, let's jump into the finance segment here. Um, we we got oil down about one dollar, mainly due to Middle East peace talks and 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 some doubt on U.S. rate cuts. Before we dive into that, we'll quickly kind of cover some of the top line numbers here. Um, 
uh, top line numbers here. We've got S&P 500. It was up about three tenths of a percentage point today. NASDAQ about 3.3 3 percentage points as well. We saw two and 10 year yields fairly flat. Dollar index down about a half a percentage point. Um, crude oil fairly flat. Was down early in the session. Currently closed here uh, about uh, up about a tenth of a percentage point. 82.73 at the time we are recording this. Brent oil 88. 57 natural gas nice little pop today over two dollars great to see um natural gas pop over two dollars um you know I, I again why is oil down we're seeing a little bit of the residual effects of what should be toted as a great thing um the, the relaxing of the tensions in the middle east that's good um if, if i always am, am, am a little sketchy when someone says oh war Yay, oil price is going up. It's like, well, do we want war, though? I, I, I don't know what the, the, the balance is between that. But what we do know is this, that there also has come into question now that the continued U.S. inflation data doesn't look good, but it also could impact what oil prices go. If we're going to see a rate cut, that does mean prices... Um, um, may not necessarily run because again if prices are cut there's going to be a lot more things so you know if interest rate cuts while they may be good for um the economy and definitely good for oil prices um if that inflation continues to stay high we're not going to see those rate cuts and it's going to continue to be a little bit of what quote unquote is a drag on prices john cudcliffe he's a partner over again capital i'm just reading from the article here um you're seeing the geopolitical risk premium leak out again today because of no new escalation in the israel hamas situation i mean these are just fabulous quotes here folks and i say that with absolute sarcasm here the geopolitical risk is leaking out again because of no new escalation. It's like, dude, like, yeah, let's stop your warmonger here. It's a good thing. It's a great thing. Um, a ceasefire, and this is his next quote, a ceasefire or hostage negotiate, uh, negation release would take out even more risk premium. Well, hopefully your risk premium goes to zero in that case, bro, because I don't, I think this, we, you know, I don't, we don't need to go to war with Iran here. So, you know, we'll let Israel and Hamas do what they want to do, but I'm more worried about the general conflict there. And I think that's, again, what he's referencing this. So I don't mean to pick on that, but it's it's always had a bone there. And again, if with, with inflation data being up in March, it doesn't, we don't necessarily know, you know, to, to kind of back that up. We did see North America post fresh rig losses week over week. We were down six um, from the prior week and we're still down 142 rigs year over date. Canada also saw a drop of nine rigs while we saw internationally plus 13. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty incredible. We also saw the frack, uh, uh, frack count spread drop. Um, it's currently sitting at 200, um, a, a little over 250 or 230, um, right now, which is again, in a, you know, as completion rigs and drilling rigs continue to drop, obviously we know natural gas prices have a lot to do with some of those, uh, completion rigs going on now, $2 natural gas. We never know. It, it, it's becoming an interesting conundrum here as we continue to see prices go, you know, oil prices continue to stay high. Continue prices, we I mean, we're over eighty four, eighty three dollars right now. I do think that the um, the biggest, you know, kind of hurt right now is the fact that you know I think people. This tells me something. Eighty five dollar oil, we're losing rigs. This tells us something. What is it telling us? I think people are. It, this shows us that the quantity of of tier, in my opinion, tier one acreage is slightly diminishing. And this is the first, in my opinion, sign of things to come of that we, we may not have as much tier one acreage as we think. And in terms of U.S. onshore production, obviously growth is where the offshore is going to come. And I think that's where you're going to see rigs possibly start picking up. I mean, $85 oil, a good offshore, it, it should pay out. I think this is an interesting conundrum, though, when we look at where rig counts are going. I think people have talked in the past. Again, I'm not saying anything crazy. Oh, we're out of tier one acres. Many people are saying that. But if there's ever cracks and you know threads to their argument, it's things like this. $85 oil, yet we're shedding rigs for weeks now. This is not just a week, week over week thing. This is a multiple week. We're down 142 from last year. What? There's something to this. And, and maybe it's the inflation. Maybe it's service costs are are still inflated due to that price. And, you know, I know, you know, a lot of the economics I run, it's the CapEx that kills it. It's not the the, the production's there. It's does the CapEx fit. And that's when people say, are we running out of oil? No, we're running out of cheap oil. You know, it's just, that's what we're running out of. So I think there's a little bit of, but 
you know, this this brings up a super interesting point. I want to pop over now and cover um, two earnings real quick, Exxon and Chevron, because I think they 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 tell two different stories here. So first, Exxon Mobil, their stock actually on Friday falls relative um, to to their current stock price. They were down about uh, one two percentage points after an earnings miss on lower natural gas prices and squeezed refining margins. Um, and I'm going to read straight from the article here. Exxon Mobil reported first quarter earnings that missed expectations as the industry came under pressure from eroding refining margins and collapsing gas prices. This is something that we'll see both in Exxon and Chevron. Here's what Exxon reported: um, they went at, they were about uh, earnings per share was about two dollars and six cents versus a street guidance of about two dollars and 20 cents revenue was 83.8 billion which is higher relative to um um the expected 78.35 billion um but that net income which is a much better uh proxy for how the the, the quarter went 8.22 billion which was actually a decrease about 28% uh quarter over or year over year from the same time last year um 11.3 billion so that's about again 28% while revenue did beat expectations it was lower than a year ago um at 86.5 billion kind of the quote coming out you know the sentiment coming out from Exxon CEO Darren Woods um they were in line you know the, the results were in line with the company's plans um attributing much of the earnings to non-cash and inventory adjustments you know I love quote in some cases we outperform you love it. it's in our free cash flow from operations which exceed consents by billion dollars again non-gap number yes i'm all about free cash flow um you know i think the one thing that that, that gets brought up here is the squeezes refining margins natural gas prices plunging we've lost about 30 percent 37 percent this year but also lower refining margins refining we i didn't this story didn't quite make the cut but shell came out and said they make a billion dollars a year off trading not that this is exactly what Exxon's doing because they're not an active trader, but you can see the downstream effects on how margins can make or break you and being on one side or the other can really be helpful. So tight, tight market, companies like Shell can make money because they have trading operations. You as the refiner get squeezed when those margins come down specifically. Exxon does have Guyana, which is going to continue as an offshore development, going to continue to kind of stabilize what they're doing. We know they are locked currently in a dispute with Chevron over that Hess acquisition. I will be recording most likely next week uh, with, with a friend of the show, Bennett Williams, on specifically what's going on in our next deal spotlight. Super interesting there. Um, it, 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 you know, they, he, he said today, he said mainly they're not looking to buy Hess, but they want to know if they want to retain the Guyana rights, which would probably negate the entire Chevron deal because Chevron is buying Hess to get access to Guyana because Hess is sitting on a pretty valuable, valuable position right now. So Exxon is, you know, if we want to get an idea, the stock opened about, you know, $3 lower, you know, it was, it was trading at uh, $121 even on Thursdays. Uh, earnings release comes out, traded all the way down to about 116th, clawed its way back here as you listen to this on Tuesday um, to about $119, still down about $3 from its peak yesterday. So trying to climb out of a hole here um, and, and that. The other one I want to bring up is, is Chevron. They went ahead and released um, um, their earnings as well. Um, you know, they had about, um, you know, they did relatively adjust, you know, they were relatively uh, similar adjusted earnings were about 5.4 billion. Um, that was uh, down about 13, yeah, about 13 to 15% from 6.7 billion last uh, compared to last year. Um, while they did see about a 12% boost in worldwide production, that again, that's mainly attributable um, to PDC Energy, which owns stuff in the Permian and the DJ Basin. Um, that basically worked out to a net equivalent production surge, about 35% relative to the previous um, year. Um, the other part that, that really kills them again is that lower refine re margins on the refined product sales and decreased natural gas prices. So uh, what I wanted to really point out with both Exxon and Chevron is that you can see how these big integrated companies, they a big profit center for them is the refining sector. And if it continues to get squeezed as it has been, um, that's what happens. Now, the reason why Chevron hasn't necessarily lost as much, let's go back to the, the stock price here. Chevron opened, uh, stock price was trading about $165 a share, only dropped about $163. At the end of the day, was trading above 
166 and currently sits um, today a little bit uh, just shy of 167. So they've outperformed relative to what Exxon has done based upon this earnings report. And part of it has to do with their um, their their massive increase in new upstream volume. And that's really what hit there. Because remember, that Pioneer acquisition, Exxon's still waiting to close that. It's one of the reasons Exxon wanted to buy Pioneers because they're seeing exactly what Chevron is realizing with PDC, which initiated them to go try to buy Hess. And now they're in the dispute. So all this stuff is interconnected as you, as you, as you go on to see. Um, Chevron also uh, noted that they had a strong balance sheet with a net debt ratio of about 8.8%, which showed really great management. Cash flow from operations at about $6.8 billion. That was a decrease from seven point two. Um you know, they, they they claim they spent a little bit more outlays. And then they kind of go on in their IR per lease to talk about all their strategic initiatives. They throw some carbon management in there, which they'll never get to. But, hey, point is, again, these big, large national companies, they're going to, the, the you know, these integrated companies, they they rely a lot on those big refining profit centers to, to, to bulk up a lot of money when they can't replace their inventory. Chevron's done a good job of it. It's why they've continued to surge here and have kind of outpaced relative to the earnings release of Exxon a little bit. So um, Exxon very much looking forward to closing that Pioneer deal. Let's quickly close here with Kimberlidge. Uh, they release a presentation outlining urgent need for board change at Silverbow. This is round four. You know, ding, 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 ding. We can get a little, uh, <laughs> um, what you would call it, uh, a little boxing ring going here. Kimberlidge has, has, you know, holding about 12.9% of Silverbow shares. Um, has basically fired back round four. Um, you know, really the, the, the biggest... <laughs> You know, we've talked about this at length. Silverbow is trying to hold off a corporate takeover by Kimridge. They say they're trying to um, basically launch and take over proxy war with the company so that Silverbow would buy Texas Kimridge Gas, which is formerly Laredo, at a valuation that they don't think is right. They think that uh, they're over that uh, Kimridge is overvaluing KTG and wants to merge with Silverbow and basically take over Silverbow so that Silver they can use Silverbow's balance sheet to buy Texas Cambridge gas, which they believe is overvalued. They walk through four claims here quickly. First, silver, but, and this is Cambridge's rebuttal to what came out two weeks. I mean, if you haven't followed this saga, guys, unbelievable. I think we need to do a deal spotlight on this first thing. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on with this. Here's the first, you know, claims that Cambridge locks a proxy fight to facilitate a path to change. Um, this is Silverbow's claims. Kimridge launched a proxy fight to facilitate a path to change control of the company without paying a premium to Silverbow shareholders. Cambridge then kind of fires back and says they haven't bought shares in over six, uh, 650 days. They were engaged with them for over two years and asked for a specific thing. Uh, Silverbow then says Cambridge directors that they nominated, because remember in this proxy battle, Cambridge is trying to nominate new board members. Silverbow claims these Cambridge directors are conflicted with uh, and, and would not look out for shareholders in the best interests. Um, Cambridge or Cambridge fires back and says they're highly qualified, independent. And then the third quote that uh, Silverbow claims is that Silverbow strategy has proven to be resilient through market cycles. This is where the fireworks. Kimrich fires back and says that quote specifically. They go, Silverbow has generated negative four TSR since CEO Sean Wolverton's tenure and 2.6 annualized TSR over Ellipser and Warriors. Lengthy tenures. Ooh, hit him with a cheap company trades at the lowest valuation multiple out of its peers that on a five-year basis. Espo has stock has underperformed the blended commodity group by 58%, highlighting the lack of alpha generated from leadership. Ooh, so the rebuttal from Cambridge goes at the three key points that um, round three Silverbow claimed in their, you know, the future of Silverbow.com or whatever website they put out. So they're going right at it. Where do I stand on this? We've talked about this much. I think there's, you know, there's there's, there's room in the middle. Is Kimbridge overvaluing Kimbridge Texas Gas? Probably. Much as any company who owns something will do that. I've been part of numerous organizations who you ask what we, you know, internally they much more value their assets than what they do on the street. The reason why they do that is because they still own that. Because if somebody valued them more than you do, you would transact with them. So there's there's a reason for that. So do I think they're trying to force it? Do I also agree the fact that Silverbow has underperformed relative to its position? Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, common. I mean, everybody knows that. It's something that it's behounded Silverbow for years. Kimridge is trying to step on an opportunity. It's interesting that there's this claim that they, that, you know, six months ago, they couldn't get financing. Silverbow fired back in one of their rounds. Um, that, hey, you had a we had an agreement, but you couldn't find financing. And they were using that to say, oh, well, that's because it was a bad investment. I don't quite know if I know that for sure, but I do think um, 
it, it's 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 pretty obvious that Silverbow management has underperformed relative to the market. So it's going to be interesting to see where this thing goes. I'm sure they'll be around five guys, but we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and leave it there. I appreciate you hanging with me here on this packed finance segment. Um, Stu again will be in the chair tomorrow, rocking a solo show. I'm out on assignment myself. Get to go uh, play oil man for the day. We will both be back in the chair Wednesday, um, um, and and get you guys that episode for Thursday. So appreciate everybody checking us out. World's greatest podcast, Energy Newsby for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.